In this video, I want to show you the Hilbert transform and what it could be used for. So in particular, I will cut to the chase and I want to show you the mathematical definition and some important mathematical properties. But I really want to show you the importance of this transform. And in particular, in this case, I want to show you that if we have a signal, and in this case, the signal is represented in blue here. So you can see this oscillatory behavior of the signal. And then in red here, we have the so-called envelope of the signal. The envelope can be obtained thanks to the Hilbert transform. So let's start. The Hilbert transform of the function f of tau, and in particular we will indicate the transform like this, h, and this is applied to the function f of tau, and it will give us another function which will depend on t. So the definition is 1 over pi, and then we have the principal value of an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then here we have the function f of tau divided by d minus tau d tau. This is the definition. And this is the mathematical definition, but I want to show you that from this mathematical definition we can derive some important properties. And at the end of this lecture we will get to the envelope. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a function f of tau like this, e to the i omega tau. So this will be our function f of tau. This is actually very important because we know that in general a function can be also written by using a Fourier transform or a Fourier series. Okay, so you can think both ways, doesn't really matter. And that's important because the Fourier transform or the Fourier series is defined in terms of this complex exponential. So if we find the Hilbert transform of this, we are able to understand how the Hilbert transform of a function, of a generic function f of tau, behaves. So let's start from this. And in particular, we will have to consider as an integrand, we have e to the i omega tau divided by t minus tau. From here, we will consider the, the following complex function e to the i omega z divided by t minus z. And then I want to understand how this function behaves when I have a contour of this kind. So we have to integrate over the real axis at the end of the day. So I need to consider also a contour comprising the real axis, but I have to avoid the discontinuity z equal to t. And then we have to close the contour, for example, like this, but it's not the only choice. Uh, it's, we, we could also close it from below. It depends on the sign of omega, and we will see that. I'm assuming that omega is greater than zero. So here we have this continuity. Here, for example, we have the origin. So in this case, I've assumed that t is greater than zero, but this is not really important. What really matters here is uh, the sign of omega, and we will see that. This is the um, imaginary axis, and uh, you get the idea. So we have to integrate over this contour. Now, if we integrate over this uh, larger semi-circumference here, we, whose radius is equal to capital R, and we will let capital R go to infinity. If we integrate over that, so we have to integrate from 0 to pi, and um, I am assuming that I can parameterize the semi-circumference like this, z will be equal to capital R e to the i theta. So at the end of the day, I will transform the integral over that contour to an integral from 0 to pi of e to the i omega, capital R. And then here I have e to the i theta. I divide by t minus r e to the i theta, r i e to the i theta d theta. And this can be rewritten like this. It's an integral from 0 to pi e to the i omega r cosine theta times e to the minus omega r sine theta r i e to the i theta divided by t minus capital R e to the i theta d theta. And now let's focus on this term. Since we have chosen omega such that 
omega is greater than zero, then this quantity here will be greater than zero. Since sine of theta is positive, or I should say non-negative, over this larger semi-circumference here. So when a capital R goes to infinity, this will go to zero for theta between zero and pi. So zero and pi are excluded because the sine would be zero, and therefore here we get one. But those are just two points, and overall, the integration will have to give me zero because I'm integrating zero at the end of the day. So this function here will not explode if r goes to infinity because you have r here and r here, so you can analyze it with a little bit more precision because you should consider the magnitude of this and then try to understand whether this could explode or not. But this function here, I mean, it's quite easy to understand that it will not blow up. So we can say that the integral over this larger semi-circumference will uh, lead to a zero result. Then we have the integral over the smaller semi-circumference, and in that case, we are going to parameterize the integral over the semi-circumference like this. Z will be equal to t plus rho e to the i theta. And then during the integration, at some point of the integration, we'll have to let rho go to zero. That's what uh, must happen, right? In, in this case, let me call the semi-circumference epsilon, so we'll have to integrate over epsilon, and we can transform this integration to an integration over an angle theta. So in this case, we have to integrate from pi to zero because we are, we are moving along the path, the contour, like this. So here in the semi-circumference, we, we are moving like this. We are moving clockwise, like this. And therefore, here we have to integrate from pi to zero. And we have e to the i omega. And then instead of z, we have t plus rho e to the i theta. And then we divide by, we have t minus, and then here I have um, z. Instead of z, I have t, and then I have minus rho e to the i theta. And then I have rho i e to the i theta d theta, like this. And this gives integral from 0 to pi. So I'm integrating from, from 0 to pi because I'm using this minus sign to change the order of integration here. So I have e to the i omega t, e to the i omega rho, e to the i theta, i d theta, like this. And now when I integrate and when I let rho go to zero, I have i pi e to the i omega t. So this happens when rho goes to zero. And now I, have, I can use the fact that the integral over the whole contour, so over the closed contour of e to the i omega z over t minus z dz, this should be equal to zero because there is no discontinuity contained in the contour. I mean, this is just a choice because we chose to exclude the discontinuity from the contour, this, this discontinuity here. Had I chosen this uh, smaller semi-circumference to move in this, in this uh, way, so counterclockwise from below, then I would have included this discontinuity and of course I should have used the residue theorem, basically. So now from here, what I get is that the principal value from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the i omega tau divided by t minus tau d tau is equal to minus i pi e to the i omega t. And remember that omega should be greater than zero because otherwise we could not say that the integral over this larger semi-circumference goes to zero, right? And in that case, if omega is negative, we should uh, choose the contour from below. So we should close the contour from below. But I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to consider omega to be positive. And this can be written also 
like this so we can also rewrite this as pi and then i have e to the i omega t minus pi over 2 right it's it's basically the same because e to the i minus pi over 2 is minus i this is what we can write therefore what we have shown so if we divide by pi we have 1 over pi here we can get rid of pi and we can get rid of pi here we have found that the Hilbert transform of the function e to the i omega tau which will be a function of t is equal to e to the i omega t minus pi over 2 and remember that omega is greater than 0 if omega were negative you can show that instead of a minus here you have a plus but that's not really of interest to us in this video now this is an important result because in general for example if you have a Fourier series you have a summation of this kind you have summation over n and then you have c sub n e to the i omega sub n t right so you have these functions here therefore when you apply the Hilbert transform you will get something similar but the argument of the complex exponential will be shifted by plus or minus pi over 2 depending on the sign of omega and this can be also written in the following way so we can find the Hilbert transform of e to the i omega tau plus phi so I have added this constant phi phi is a constant here so this will depend on t and the result will be e to the i omega t minus pi over 2 plus phi and here I'm assuming that omega is greater than 0 now if we take the real part on both sides what I get is the Hilbert transform of the cosine of omega tau plus phi which depends on t is equal to the cosine of omega t minus pi over 2 plus phi but this is equal to the sine of omega t plus phi so you can see that the cosine is simply transformed into a sine so remember that the Fourier series can be written in this form for example take a signal x of t and we have to sum over n a n cosine so we are going to rewrite it in terms of the cosines omega n t plus phi n so we also have the shifts here because there are the phases these are the phases of the signal and these are the amplitudes right and omega and you can consider omega n to be a, a non-negative quantity right in this uh, in this representation whereas when you rewrite the Fourier series in the complex representation with the complex exponentials then you might have also negative frequencies in that case here we are just considering not negative frequencies and therefore when you apply the Hilbert transform to this function here you are going to get instead of the cosine here the sine right so if you write the following function x of t plus i times the Hilbert transform of x of tau which depends on t so the, the Hilbert transform will depend on the variable t this will give you summation over n of a n and then here we have the complex exponential e to the i omega n t plus phi n right because you have this quantity this signal plus i times summation over n a n sine of omega n t plus phi n so this will be x of t plus i h x of tau which depends on t right and basically you can rewrite this in this form now this is actually quite interesting because this is a complex signal which is called a analytic signal so you can construct an analytic signal from a real signal you can get back the original signal simply by considering the real part of this but this is actually quite important because now we can calculate the magnitude of this signal here this signal here has a magnitude which depends on time so let me call it a of t and then it will have a phase e to the i phi let's call phi tilde of t and this will be a tilde of t 
for example. I mean, this is just notation. So if you calculate the magnitude of this, you will get a tilde of t. And what is a tilde of t? That's a magnitude which depends on time, but it's exactly this envelope here. It's exactly this envelope here. So that's why the Hilbert transform is actually important. There are other factors that come into play when uh, we have to deal with the Hilbert transform. So this is actually one thing that you could do with the Hilbert transform. You can find the envelope of a signal. This is actually very important in signal processing.